science lecture is on urban sustainability, uh, particularly as it relates to cities uh, in the global south. Uh, so when we look at contemporary cities, what do we see? Uh, in uh, industrialized countries, cities have largely become shaped to build, uh, to become uh, automobile sized. Uh, that is to say, they're, they're designed and built in order to accommodate aut automobiles uh, and allow little or no access to uh, pedestrians uh, in many parts of the city. So you see landscapes like this, uh, where you only see cars, vehicles on the road and uh, no pedestrians, no uh, bicycles and so on. And even for people to get across uh, these areas, it becomes very complicated because uh, of highways coming in between and so on. What this uh, generates is a kind of land use pattern that's known as sprawl. Uh, sprawl is the relentless growth of uh, cities well beyond their uh, limits uh, just because it becomes easier uh, to live far away uh, from the centers of, uh, of these cities. Uh, and in turn, what ends up happening is uh, uh, you have jobs uh, and other amenities uh, away from cities. If you look at uh, uh, two cities having the same population, uh, the city of Atlanta and the city of uh, uh, Barcelona, roughly the same population, because Barcelona was largely built around public transport, around buses and uh, trains, uh, it's re retained its compact shape. Uh, in contrast, Atlanta in the United States uh, has encountered a lot of sprawl, it's spread out, uh, it's become automobile sized. Uh, so sprawl is self-reinforcing in the sense that residences, shops, schools, jobs and recreation are all distant from one another and they require cars and a built environment to support them. So, so that's, that's what uh, you see in many uh, cities uh, in the global north, but certainly not all as uh, I showed you, this example of Barcelona being quite different from Atlanta. Uh, what happens in the global south or uh, conventionally known as a third world uh, is several other factors. Uh, so in the developing world, uh, urbanization has taken place largely in a mixed mode. Uh, there's, there's lots of legacies uh, over time, lots of different things shaping those, uh, those cities. Uh, so one of them is, 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 the, is the state or the government attempts to shape the city along design strategies developed in wealthy countries. Uh, so that is a, is a push towards uh, more automobilization, more cars, more highways, uh, uh, less uh, access for pedestrians, even though uh, the bulk of the users of roads uh, tend to be pedestrians, uh, people without access to cars, uh, they tend to be um, um, bicyclists and so on. Uh, other challenges, of course, in, uh, in uh, third world cities uh, is, 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 is that uh, there's very dense mixed use housing, uh, lots of slums, we'll go over what uh, slums uh, imply in third world cities, uh, and, and, and many modes of vehicles, different types of vehicles leading to uh, uh, an overall slowdown on the streets. Slums uh, uh, imply poor access to infrastructure. Uh, there's both in terms of the, the physical concentration and dispersion and uh, there's both formal and informal modes of labor associated with, uh, 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 with, with uh, slums. Uh, but, but the, but the uh, good news about uh, many developing country cities is uh, that uh, if, uh, uh, you know, transport modes were to be, transport planning were to be uh, well designed. It's actually helpful to have this mixed uh, high density and mixed use, meaning uh, residences and shops and, uh, and schools and so on are, tend to be in close proximity. So it's possible to make uh, developing country cities less prone to sprawl. Now, if we looked at um, a country like India, uh, we see that India has really um, a, a very large diversity and that's one of the challenges that uh, produces difficulties for uh, planning in cities. Uh, you have a small fraction of the population that actually tends to be very influential. 5% uh, uh, of the population has an average income of around uh, 20,000 US dollars. They're roughly uh, the size of half of Russia. Uh, and then you have 65% of the population 
having uh, a much lower average income, uh, roughly the same uh, per capita GDP as Ghana, and they're five times the size of Ghana, this 65 percent of the population, and about 30 percent of the population, roughly those below the poverty line, uh, have the same average income as uh, Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire. So, so you see this vast diversity also affecting the way in which uh, city planning is, 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 is sort of uh, compromised in, in many developing countries, particularly a country like India. Now, when we come to this question of slums, um, there's, uh, the, uh, slums are ubiquitous across the uh, developing world. Uh, you also find uh, slums even in uh, 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 some rich countries like the US. Uh, and what, what really happens uh, in slums is that uh, these are either formal or informal settlements of very poor people living in very uh, uh, difficult conditions, conditions where the infrastructure is, is poor, the access to uh, particularly water sanitation uh, tends to be very poor. Now, this is what a typical slum looks like. Uh, you have, uh, as you can tell, there's, a, there's a, a very poor quality housing. Uh, the housing is also uh, alongside a river bank or a canal usually because that's also the sort of the, uh, it, 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 it epitomizes the sort of the informality of these, uh, these settlements, the illegality of these settlements if you like. And uh, so, uh, and conditions are, are, are pretty pathetic because uh, uh, there's a lot of pollution that people are exposed to and, um, and, and, and uh, very crowded conditions leading to disease and, uh, and other challenges. Now, uh, another word for slums is uh, squatter settlements. Reason for that is that uh, these are essentially settlements where people have decided to uh, live in conditions in proximity to their jobs and, and squatters are considered illegal uh, settlers and uh, so they're always living in precarious conditions. Uh, as, uh, as I already mentioned, crowding is a, is a big challenge in these squatter settlements. Uh, the, the land that is squatted upon is not well developed, uh, so there's very f little access to services. And uh, squatting sometimes takes place either on public property or on private property. And sometimes speculative land holding is, is, uh, is responsible for, is, is, a, is a site where uh, uh, squatter settlements can be found. Um, sometimes uh, regulatory requirements or rent controls make investing on such land unprofitable. Squatters do not pay formal rent, uh, but uh, they do incur costs. Usually, they're paying, uh, they're paying some kind of rent uh, or some kind of uh, money, some kind of fee uh, to people who control the land. Now, uh, what are the forces of urbanization in general? What causes uh, cities to form uh, and, 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 and how do these take shape? Um, Paul Krugman, a uh, well-known economist, has uh, divided these into centripetal and centrifugal forces. Uh, f uh, so the centripetal forces are forces that actually cause uh, cities to, uh, to form, concentrated uh, settlements to, to form, uh, has to do with uh, <coughs> a variety of factors. So uh, one of them, of course, uh, is uh, that there are natural advantages of particular sites usually uh, you know, a valley or, a, or a, the mouth of a river uh, near a port uh, and so on. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the fact that a, a, a place is a central location at the confluence of roads of major highways can also be a, a reason for a city to form, uh, for, uh, for cities to, uh, cities are, are, are really uh, used to be many cities in these kinds of centers of uh, highways or at mouths of rivers near harbors used to be trading posts, trading towns, market towns. And so uh, <clears throat> market conditions uh, also create uh, urbanization or sort of, uh, sort of pull cities together. Um, access to markets, what are known as backward linkages, when there's a hinterland, uh, that's, uh, that's a reason for a, a, a city to grow, or to form and grow. Um, access to products, uh, again, when for, for trade, uh, and, and labor markets. So the fact that uh, you have large concentrations of, 
of especially young people available for work. That's also a reason for, for cities to form. And uh, cities uh, can also uh, grow because of what are known as knowledge spillovers. You might have a university or a set of uh, training institutes nearby and that, that causes that and because the people, well educated people, uh, trained people coming out of these universities, you have uh, 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 cities growing in these areas. Now some of the centrifugal forces, forces that, that, uh, that, uh, that work against uh, concentrated uh, urban settlements uh, could be again related to markets, so, so questions of uh, uh, you know, the, the prices, land prices uh, and so on becoming too high, uh, commuting costs becoming high. Um, the pull of dispersed resources such as, such as farmland mainly uh, as a result of uh, 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 advantages being outside and then there could be non-market uh, forces as well. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, people might feel that uh, the, the aesthetic qualities of a, of a city uh, are no longer attractive, some other place is more attractive uh, uh, or technologies might also lead to the, 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 the growth of uh, you know, telecommuting uh, and so on. So, so that might also uh, leave cities uh, less crowded or you might have a, a natural disaster uh, as in the case of New Orleans uh, which uh, lost a lot of its population because people were afraid of uh, the kinds of conditions that might uh, recur over there. And so congestion and pollution are also uh, uh, forces that uh, cause pe people to stay away from uh, cities. Now coming back to this question of slums, slums are seen as a blight in cities. They're, they're unattractive and so there's been a, a lot of uh, emphasis on trying to uh, trying to remove or eradicate uh, slums in many parts of the developing world. So slum demolition programs have been promoted especially by uh, the wealthier communities in cities, largely to make the cities look uh, more attractive. Uh, and so residential welfare associations may want to clean up and, and reduce crime and so on. The other uh, uh, set of questions has to do with the fact that uh, professional uh, knowledge or planning uh, knowledge uh, deployed to sup supplant local knowledge uh, and this results in the erosion of the informal economy. So many slums are actually sites of lots of production, uh, um, maybe the informal production but also uh, they contribute to the formal economy uh, in many ways and th this has been proven time and again. Uh, slums are also uh, places which house a bulk of a city's uh, 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 working classes uh, and uh, this uh, is true particularly in cities like Mumbai, uh, Mexico City and so on and uh, uh, so and that's usually ignored. So when slum cleanup takes place, uh, people are displaced, they're usually sent to, to housing that's far away from the cities and uh, that changes the nature of the labor market in cities. Now successful cases of rehabilitation are also found. Uh, and so successful cases of rehabilitation would mean that people are given better conditions, uh, living conditions and safer most conditions to live in. That largely improves their lives but also ensures that the labor forces within the, the, the urban settlement are not eroded as a result. But at the same time, uh, you also have to uh, make sure that you, uh, you overcome other patronage and exploitation conditions that, uh, that are prevalent in many slums and, uh, and pr providing infrastructure, um, water sanitation and what's known as pakka housing or a well-built housing uh, and rights to the community-led organizations. These, are, these become very important to make these informal economies self-sustaining. In um, uh, the case of Dharavi in uh, Mumbai, uh, the, the, there are over 400 recycling uh, units, 30,000 rag pickers. These, these individuals, these people, you know, really sustain uh, much of uh, the city of Mumbai. The 6,000 tons of rubbish are sorted every day. Um, in 2007, The Economist magazine reported that uh, in v Vietnam and Mozambique, waves of gleaners sift through the sweepings of Hanoi's streets just as Mozambican children pick over the rubbish of Maputo's main uh, tip. So this is, this is something 
is very, very common. Uh, this, uh, people living in slums uh, end up uh, being those, being essential to the city's services. There's a book on the subject called The World's Scavengers by Martin Medina uh, and, and in Lagos in Nigeria, uh, which is widely considered the world's most chaotic society, uh, city. There's an environment day on the last, day of, uh, last Saturday of every month and from 7 to 10 a.m. nobody drives and the city tries to tidy itself up. So there are m multiple ways in which uh, uh, slum dwellers are, are revitalizing, are themselves revitalizing uh, cities in the global south. The question of in situ rehabilitation uh, is very important uh, because it's a way of revitalizing um, people living in, in these slums and it also uh, helps ensure that the city's uh, economy doesn't uh, uh, doesn't decline as a result of the labor uh, large uh, part of the labor market disappearing. So in, in Mumbai's case, has you, uh, th they've used an innovative method of using the land on which slums are located to build tenement housing, uh, part of which was provided free to residents and part of which was sold at market rates to finance the construction. So these kinds of innovative methods to, to actually raise money for in-city re rehabilitation have been tried. Uh, and there's, there's of course the scope for some kind of misappropriation in these conditions, or these circumstances, uh, but uh, there's also been a lot of success stories. In Ahmedabad, uh, which is another in-situ case uh, where there was in-situ rehabilitation, uh, there was a partnership between government bodies, non-governmental organizations, uh, microfinance uh, bank and slum residents in, in carrying out uh, slum upgrading. And you've seen this also in uh, the de developed world. Philadelphia had a, uh, ha had a, had a very successful case. Uh, in, uh, in, in Pakistan, in Karachi, the Orangi case has also been widely cited as, as a as very successful uh, form of in-situ rehabilitation of slum dwellers. Dharavi is uh, really uh, uh, Asia's largest slum and it contains tens of thousands of small businesses. Uh, so vital to the city's uh, uh, economy, as I mentioned earlier, and hundreds of thousands of residents of different religions, castes, languages, provinces, and ethnicities. So it, it, its enterprises include food, garments, leather products, pottery, printing, jewelry, recycling, and the turnover of the, of the slum alone is about uh, 2,000 crores a year. So a very uh, vibrant uh, economic powerhouse in many ways. Uh, so these are some of the, uh, this is a map of uh, Dharavi and uh, Dharavi residents have uh, themselves organized, uh, have rather organized themselves into groups uh, to adopt a common rehabilitation program and uh, this is seen as an alternative to the official alternative redevelopment plan. So, so bringing in the participation of the stakeholders uh, it seems to be very important in these uh, slum rehabilitation uh, experiments. And uh, this is not something that uh, can be, slums are not something that should be wished away. Uh, rather, they, 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 they need to be uh, uh, rehabilitated. They need, they need, they need uh, better infrastructure because it turns out that they are usually at the center of a city's uh, people. The Dharavi Redevelopment Project uh, was initiated through a very large NGO called SPARC, uh, the Society for the uh, Promotion of uh, uh, Area Resource Centers. And they played a significant role with the government uh, for providing uh, uh, housing for 50,000 families. And the policy was confronted uh, by a number of challenges. There was insufficient su supply of land. It was Mumbai after all, uh, insufficient data. Uh, lack of coordination among agencies, lack of resources and rigid planning norms. Uh, so, so all of these had to be overcome uh, in order for uh, this redevelopment project to be, uh, to, to have the sort of success it has had. There was a focused uh, attempt at improving land supply, infrastructure, information systems, management and repair of existing house stock and public awareness was a big part of this. Um, the, the, and participation, of course. The policy has been um, useful, has been proven useful in, in cases where rehabilitation is necessitated by vital infrastructure pro projects. Under the current policy, around 100,000 houses have been constructed 
and an equal number are under construction. So the Dharavi case is something that uh, uh, it was a very difficult uh, environment in Asia's largest slum uh, and, and uh, the fact that uh, attempts even in a place like that have been uh, successful uh, suggests that uh, hope is not lost in terms of how to deal with slums in, in, in uh, developing countries.